Good morning. Welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It is always such a joy to be gathered as God's people. <clears throat> and uh, as we begin our service of worship, I do want to encourage you to those who are here to sign those friendship pads and look for new names or old names and um, be welcoming as you, as you do and as you are. Uh, if you're online with us, we encourage you to sign in there too. Leave a comment. Make sure that we know you're with us. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be gathered as God's people in any way we can. As we begin our service, I do want to acknowledge that uh, Jake Spinella is on a trip checking on a new family member. I think he has a, a, a new nephew or niece, I'm not sure which, so be in prayer for him as he travels. <clears throat> also, this week begins our worship readiness classes. Uh, the young disciples will go and explore what it means to, to worship in the way that we do. Uh, and that's open to pretty much, I think we, we have said in the past up to second grade, but really it's available for any of our children and we're going to be able to engage them on whatever level they're at and whatever level they need. Um, so that begins this Sunday and it goes through the next couple of Sundays. Also, we are entering into something that the Presbyterian Church USA calls a season of peace. There are some different uh, opportunities that lead up to the, um, the, the Peace and Global Witness offering, which usually is taken up the first Sunday of October. Um, and so we're going to do some different things before then to kind of explore what that all means. Um, in our uh, pub theology group, we're looking at nonviolence. Uh, last month, we looked at nonviolence in the teachings of Jesus. This week, we'll be looking at nonviolence in the epistles and the New Testament. Um, and we hope you'll join us. It's on the third Friday of the month. Um, and there are announcements in the bulletin and online about that. We also have a Lunch and Learn coming up. Um, for this season of peace and what is the date for that I think it's in the bulletin there it's next Sunday okay that's what I thought all right so next Sunday make plans to stay after church for that lunch and learn um, I believe that we're going to have a uh, Clancy for the lunch and learn are we going to have kind of a meal of simplicity for that meal for that lunch beans and rice kind of thing Ah, there will be a child-friendly option, um, but the goal is to be in solidarity with those around the world who don't have the same options that we have. So a meal of simplicity as a part of our lunch and learn for, uh, for the season of peace takes place next Sunday after worship. Um, I do want to uh, thank the, the Gerdes family, Gerdes or Gerdes, I always get that wrong, Gerdes, Gerdes family for being here today and providing music and also Colin Smith. Uh, we give thanks for your musical gifts and look forward to uh, worshiping with you. That said, are there any other announcements that need to be made as we begin? Velma has her hand up. Oh, thank you. The first hymn number is wrong. Good catch. We, we did that just for you. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, Colin, what was the correct one? 233 three is the correct number for the first hymn. So the title of the first hymn is correct. The number is wrong. The rest of them are fine. Colin checked. Thank you for making sure that we didn't miss that. <laughs> all right. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God with all that we have and all that we are right here, right now, online, everywhere, together as God's people. Thank you. 
Please rise in body or in spirit and join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Sing God's praise in the assembly of the faithful, for the Lord takes pleasure in the people. Let the faithful sing for joy. and remind us of God's never-failing love. Join me now in the call to confession. Amid the countless things that human beings cannot fully comprehend about God, there stands this. God so loves us as to bathe us with grace and feed us with mercy and forgive us our sins. Confident in the love of God, let us pray together and then offer silent personal confessions as well. Lord God, while we were still slaves to sin, you died for our salvation. Yet we still worship the false gods of the world, forgetting that you are the Lord. Loving worldly wealth, we have not loved you with our whole heart, nor loved our neighbors as ourselves. Trusting worldly strength, we have not trusted your word, nor followed the word made flesh. Forgive me by worldly neighbors. We have not shown mercy to others, as you have shown mercy to us. Forgive us yet again, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Hear now, O God, our silent and personal confessions that we lay before you in the chapels of our hearts. Beloved of God, let us be assured of God's forgiveness. Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah.
and at this time I invite the younger disciples to join me down front. Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. You are the next contestants on a game I like to call Weird Stuff from the Bible. So, this is a game where I tell you weird stuff in the Bible, and we try to figure it out. But first, as a little warm-up, we're going to play a fashion game. You know, you know. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question I bet you do know. What do you wear when it rains? A coat. Yeah, like a rain jacket. What else? What else would you put on when it rains? Boots. Boots. Mm-hmm. A rain hat. You're going to say rain hat? Sisters, huh? Yeah, okay. Totally Transformers. Yeah, they're good rain or shine. You know, it's always never not Transformers. Okay, um, next fashion question is, what do you wear when you go to the beach? You get somebody else. A swimsuit. What else? What else? What else? A life jacket. Sandals. I wear a hat. The adults in the room are all like, what? you don't have to say that, the thing. Does anybody know what the, the adults all want you to say? Oh, I know, I know, I know. What? Sunscreen. Sunscreen. <laughs> Whew. Damn. That was close. Okay. Okay. Hold on just a minute. All right. So, uh, what about in the, like, very short period of time in Louisiana when it's cold? What do you wear when it's cold? A jacket. Leggings, okay. A hat, very good answers. Okay, these are all good answers. All of this is a lead up to the game Weird Stuff in the Bible. What? Weird Stuff in the Bible. So there is a passage in the Bible that says that we are supposed to put on our Lord Jesus Christ. Does that sound weird? No. No, you don't think so? Okay. So how do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? You answer first every time. I need somebody else. How, how do you, she's going to die if you don't answer, okay? So how do you put on the Lord Jesus Christ? How would you do that? Any ideas? Do you all want her to, to say what she has? Okay. Okay, Go ahead. Um, so I think it means to start nice and kind, mm-hmm. you should always be nice. Okay, since God is nice and kind, you should always be nice and kind. That's a good answer. What do you think? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like your shirt. It says you got a friend in me, and it has all the Toy Story guys on it. It reminds me, sometimes people wear t-shirts that will say something about Jesus to let people know that they, that they love God. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Is this one um, to carry Jesus? To carry Jesus with you? To carry God with you? Yeah. So, more than... Go ahead. Last one. You could have a hat with a fish on it. Some people have a little fish on the back of their car. I, in fact, have a little fish on the back of my car. And if you don't know what that means, y'all can talk about it when you go with Miss Treva. So, um, what's more important than necessarily having a, a fish or a shirt or whatever is having God in your heart. And like you guys said, having God with you, knowing that God's with you, and loving people the way you're loved by God. Right? Awesome. All right. So, how about you stand up and... Um, those, we usually make a little circle up here. If you guys, if you want to join, you can join us. Awesome. Are we holding hands today? No? no? Okay, we don't have to hold hands. I mean, I can, we can hold hands if you want. I don't care. Anyway, okay. Come on up. Now, everybody usually repeats after me, so we're going to pray like this. Do your hands like this. We'll do some praying hands so God knows we're serious about it. All right? <laughs> Hi, God. Hi, God. It's us. It's us. We, love we love you. Thank you. For always being with us, rain or shine. shine. Amen. Amen. Okay, now y'all can go with Miss Treva and Miss Dorinda, if you would like to. Or you can stay here with your parents, either one.
God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding that our hearts and minds may be open to know your truth and your way. Amen. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14, which you can find on page 58 of the Old Testament in your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. This is a story of the Passover of God. In many ways, this is also the birth of the Israelite nation. Listen for what the Spirit has to say to the church today through Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb from each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat of it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head and legs and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The Lord, blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as perpetual ordinance. Here ends the first reading of God's holy word. Our second, testament, or our second reading is from Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. And you can find this on page 162 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. Listen to what the Spirit has to say about our attentiveness to one another in Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are all summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not do wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. Besides this, you know that what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not reveling in drunkenness, not in debauchery or licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Here ends the second reading of God's holy word. Our gospel lesson comes to us today from Matthew's gospel, chapter 18, verses 15 to 22. You can find that on page 20 of the New Testament in your pew Bible, if you would like to read along. Now, this passage follows the parable of the lost sheep, and I think that's some important context for 
these words. Um, and I challenge you to listen for evidence of grace in a difficult topic. We're going to talk a little bit more about that afterwards. Matthew 18, 15 to 22. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if my brother or sister sins against me, how, should, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times, or as some translations have it, seven times 70. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to begin with a confession. I know we already did that. God heard me during the silent personal prayer. But I need you to know that I, I, <laughs> I did something yesterday that I have not done in a while. I overslept. Yeah, I was supposed to be at a board meeting for the Extra Mile, which is an organization that helps families in crisis uh, with everything from foster care to addiction issues and a lot of other stuff too. In fact, one of their programs, um, Avec les Enfants, you may have heard us talk about that. Uh, what that, me that program meets in our education wing every Sunday afternoon and they provide a safe and secure place for children to visit with a non-custodial parent in a, in a safe manner. Well, yesterday's meeting was set up by our very own ruling elder, Brian Weibel, who is the president of that board. He put a lot of work into that. And the purpose of the meeting was to empower the board for the work that we do together. And I have no excuse for oversleeping, apart from, you know, an ailing back from replacing a mailbox post on Friday. But suffice it to say that I received a rude awakening when I saw the texts asking me if I would be in attendance. Will you be joining us? The message was not rude. The reality of wakefulness and my error were, shall we say, an assault to my senses. Now, to his credit, Brian was gracious as always, as were the other members of the board. And I don't share this to, to gloat or to make an example of my error. I share this, I say this, because I'm betting that each of you have had an experience, one or two, where you've been awakened to unexpected circumstances, whether by your own error or some life events that was just beyond your control. Whether these experiences are good or bad or, or even unrelated to your life but still impacting your understanding of the world. R.I.P. Jimmy Buffett. Life is full of events that catch us off guard. Most of the time, we do our best to keep such things from happening or, or keep them from affecting us. You know, we set alarms, we lock doors, we associate with those who seem to share our worldview. And even so, there are still times when God breaks in. Now, there are plenty of times we would love for God to break in, especially assuming that God wants what we want. But often it seems like things are just up to us. I do wonder, no, I, I hope, I believe, I expect that God breaks in through you and me all the time. But still, it would be nice if God broke in like in our reading today, right? Well, nice for us. <laughs> it was pretty terrible for the Egyptians. <laughs> I have to admit, that going after the firstborn of the Egyptians and their livestock seems pretty cold. <laughs> In the words of the comedian Taylor Tomlinson, 
the Old Testament is like my favorite Taylor Swift album. Just banger after banger of breakup songs. Here we have God's instructions for the biggest breakup the Israelites have ever known. With blood on the door and firstborn on the floor. No, that's not like a... Anyway, but notice this. It begins with invitation, and it moves to celebration, and it ends in sanctification. That's a good lyric. It begins with invitation, moves to celebration, ends in sanctification. God's people are told to waste nothing, come together if there is anyone in need, and get ready to go. And as they went, they became a statement to the world of the active presence of the one true God of Israel. These people and the people of Egypt were awakened to a new reality. A reality that is beyond slavery in Egypt and dependent on the grace of God. Now in his letter to the church in Rome, Paul the Apostle describes those who follow the way of Jesus in the same way. We have been set free from the slavery of sin by the grace and mercy of God. And Paul uses that word grace more times in the letter to the church in Rome than any other. Makes me wonder if they really needed to hear it. If they really needed to hear that salvation is not something we can earn. It is God's choice to love us regardless of our choices. And that's not to say that our choices don't matter. It is to say that our church choices don't determine God's. Which is where grace, unmerited favor, comes in. And Paul talks a lot about slavery to sin and release by grace in the first several chapters of Romans. It's all good stuff. I encourage you to, to read through it sometime. It all leads up to chapter 8, where he wants us to know that we've been adopted into the family and household of God. And that raises the question about the firstborn of God's family, the children of Israel. And Paul spends the next couple of chapters talking about their inclusion and the new life that we all share in Christ, chapters 9 through 12. That all leads up to chapter 13 and the summary of the law that we receive today and these instructions for how to love others as much in the same way as you love yourself. Now, incidentally, one of the most uh, interesting critiques that I've heard about modern evangelical movements and to some extent old school Calvinism is that a worldview that says that we are not worthy of God's love. If I have a worldview that says I'm not worthy of God's love, that results in a worldview that no one is worthy of God's love. And nowhere in here does Paul describe our unworthiness. He describes what it's like to be enslaved to sin in chapter 7, but his point here is to love others in the way that Christ has loved us, compassionately, faithfully, gracefully. And for some, the very idea that we are loved regardless of what we do or do not deserve is a rude awakening. But to this, Paul says, wake up. It's time for salvation. Now, it's important to note here that Paul's expectation about salvation was that Jesus was coming back any minute now. The return of Jesus was imminent. Or in the words of the incomparable Tom Waits, Jesus is going to be here going to be here soon. There is nothing in Paul's writing that indicate, however, to my knowledge, that the return of Jesus meant any kind of conflict, even though he uses that phrase, armor of light. Instead, it meant that conflict would end, particularly for those that follow the way of Jesus. For example, when he used the illustration, armor of God, in Ephesians 6, he was saying, instead of a breastplate, use righteousness. Be in right relationships with God and one another, and you might not need a breastplate. Likewise, Romans 13, 12, the armor of light, meant living as one who has been redeemed. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ, in verse 13, meant changing your motivation from a person-centered, androcentric worldview to a God-centered worldview. And that doesn't mean looking down on others and relativizing sin and suffering. It means recognizing that God is active and present in all things and then living in the light of God's presence always. A God-centered worldview is so much more than asking the question, what would Jesus do? Still a good question, but it's so much more than that. It's really more like asking, what is God doing? 
What is God inviting me to be a part of? What does salvation and redemption look like for me and for those God has given me to love or for those people or situations God has given me to endure? Now, answering those questions, what, God, what is God inviting me into particularly? Answering those questions may be exciting for you. It might also be like the alarm that I turned off yesterday morning. We all have our limits, and I get that. I really do. But fortunately, God's grace does not. Though I have to say that our reading from Matthew's gospel, taken on its own, does not feel very grace-filled. I hope you found some. That's why I challenged you earlier. But there again, that's why our tradition doesn't take these scriptures out of context and view them as individual truths. We view scripture as authoritative and sufficient, but we interpret it through the lens of grace and the context of the setting. And here's what I mean by that. Chapter 17 ends with a discussion about taxes and children, just as 18 begins with Jesus telling everyone to become as children in order to enter the kingdom of God. And he follows that with the temptation to sin, which includes leading these little ones we've been talking about, leading them astray. And then delivers the parable of the lost sheep, where the shepherd leaves the 99 for the sake of the one. All of that is a setup for these instructions on regaining one who has strayed. And it, it may seem a little bit more like an intervention than a, a celebration, but that's what this is about. And then in verse 18, chapter 18, verse 18, we get this callback to chapter 16, 19 that we had a few weeks ago where Jesus warns them that when they bind or loosen something on earth, it will be so in heaven. We talked about the fact that Jesus said that in front of the shrine to Pan and the gate to the underworld, but he was talking about the keys to the kingdom of God. Now the emphasis in the text here seems to be about our agreement as followers of Jesus, that that's what God wants. And how I wish that meant that all we have to do is agree on a need and ask God together and poof. But I suspect that's not exactly what Jesus had in mind. I think Jesus was more concerned that we aligned our wills with God's than try to get God to align God's will with ours. And Jesus drives this point home in verse 21 when Peter asks, oh so sheepishly, so how many times do we need to forgive someone who has been bad is it seven times seven times enough and jesus replies peter you may be the goat on whom i'm going to build my kingdom but try 70 times seven you know essentially this was to say that there is no end to god's forgiveness so let there be none for ours and having said that it, it's still pretty hard to see that grace in verse 17 if the offender refuses to listen to even the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And friends, the only thing I can say to make sense of that is to remember the role of choice. In this case, as difficult as it is to realize, the offending member is the one rejecting the church. Hopefully that's the way these things work rather than the church rejecting others. God's goal is inclusion, but it is not coercion. God's choice is always to love, and as much as it pains me to say it, sometimes the church isn't the best vessel of God's love. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. It just means we need to be honest about our limitations, even as we are hopeful in God's limitless love, because we are still sanctified for the work of proclamation. As jarring a wake-up call as the project of inclusion can be, it is only the beginning. Because just as the Israelites were celebrated and sanctified, so are we. Through the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ, we are set free from sin and commissioned by God to love as we have been loved. You know, in fact, I'd like you to look at, the, at your bulletin, the vision and mission statements on the front. We're talking about this being commissioned to love as we have been loved. Here are some ways in which we've said we're going to do that. So if you look at the front of your bulletin, at the top, there's a vision statement. I'm, I'm not sure if it actually says vision statement, but it's a, at the, the front cover where the picture is. Close your bulletin, look at the front cover where the picture is. Close your bulletin, look at the front cover where the picture is. 
Okay, okay. I'm sorry. You have it turned around backwards. Claire's looking at me like, I've got it, okay? Uh, <laughs> at the top, this is why I need forgiveness as much or more than anyone. So at the top, you got that vision statement, and I'd like you to, to read that with me. We are a community of believers grounded in the Reformed tradition of Christian faith and growing through the experience of God's love. And then a little bit further down is the mission statement, which is how we enact that identity of our vision. We are grounded in the practice of loving God with all our hearts as we build and maintain relationships and a public witness of welcome and concern, with all our souls as we express gratitude through our generosity of spirit, with all our minds as we experience God's activity in the world. And as we grow, we seek to love God and neighbor and self equally with all that we have and all that we are. That's some good stuff. Good work, church. We spent a lot of time deciding how to say those things. And, and hopefully you'll see the summary of the law in there, just as you saw it in Paul's writings. As well as a, a nod to our Reformed heritage, which I'm glad to talk more about another time if you, if you have questions about that. If you go to our website, you'll also see some core values that go along with and unpack that a little further. But here's the thing. The session does not care if you memorize these words or core values. They only wrote these, we wrote these together as an attempt to describe who we are and what we do as God's people. Th that workshop that I mentioned, uh, almost missing yesterday, in that workshop we talked about how important it is, how much more important it is to tell others the one thing you value about the organization than to tell them everything that there is to say. And that same thing goes for this place, but I would add one more. Who we are will be determined by how we live in the light of the kingdom of God. And how do we live in this light? We put on the mantle of faith. We put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We look first to the command of Jesus and the summary of the law, and then to our neighbor, whoever that is, whoever's near us, as the first and best opportunity to love as we have been loved. Beloved of God, we have been named claimed and sanctified for one purpose, to love as we have been loved. And it starts with knowing that you are lovable and beloved by God. And it finds its fullness when you help someone else know that about themselves, even when they oversleep. And it's just that simple. And it's just that hard. And God be the glory for all of that, now and always. Amen. Friends, now let us stand and let us sing and give glory to God. Hymn 306, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds.
As we stand, let us affirm the faith we share with one of the oldest confessions of the church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we join in prayer of celebration, thanksgiving, uh, concern. How may we lift those joys and burdens together? And actually, I'm going to ask Richard to come up and use the microphone up here, because he's got some stuff to share. and. Um, It'll take too long for me to repeat. <laughs> Here you go. Most of you know Mike has been. <laughs> Most of you know Mike has been in the hospital now for three weeks today. Tuesday morning, the hospital called me to tell me his heart had stopped. He has been in intensive care since. He's been on life support, a ventilator, and this morning he regained consciousness was responsive, and so they removed the tube. He is now without life support and doing well. <laughs> Praise God. Praise be to God indeed. If you're online and you heard those soft claps, we're Presbyterian. We, that's what we do. But we have great joy with you. We celebrate this together, and we continue to pray for his recovery because I know he is itching to get out of that hospital, um, and, and we want that. Yes. It is Ben Scarra's birthday today. Fifteen. Yeah, you got a lot of. This is like birthday season for your family. Everybody. Yeah. Okay. But six kids, right? But but Ben is the youngest, and the youngest gets overlooked sometimes. You know, so. He is hard to overlook. He's rather large. Yes. Fifteen though. Yes. Prayers for travel for guests and family members. And Tim is flying to Suriname tomorrow. So we will. Safety for all of them. Yes. Okay. Okay. So Carrie, I'm going to repeat for people online. So Carrie, and I'll probably get it wrong, so you have to correct me. Carrie's, again, this was your cousin's wife who lives in Kenya and traveling to South Sudan. Does a lot of work with child brides and sex trafficking. Okay. So prayers for her safety, but also for her work, for God to move in and through all of that. Okay. Um, I haven't looked to see the recent uh, news on wildfires in, uh, in our state. Um, I'm assuming they're still burning. Um, does anybody else know about that? At least 65% contained. And we have Laura, who is from Lake Charles, who uh, has particular concerns on that. So know that we are praying for your community. The DeRitter community, where we have a church, uh, have been active, active participants in the disaster uh, response there. So we pray for them. All right. Yes. What a great thing to say in an open public prayer, you have social anxiety disorder. <laughs> sure. Actually, why don't you come on up and use the microphone? That way people who are online can hear you, because I've got to be able to repeat stuff. Okay. So this all started with social anxiety, which is really powerful that you're able to stand in front of people and say anything at all. So. Seriously, I'm unemployed, people. I have anxiety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. You're telling us about a Russian Orthodox Church. Yes, thank you. You're awesome. You're a good tour guide. Okay. They, they were very much into Mother Earth, keeping Earth pure. I'm really big in to bo the body is a temple, and I want that life source to be within me. I can't be a voice for him and play small. So I need your prayers and support. I have a few ideas. Okay. The first is to end. You can't, you can't cover up the microphone. Okay. That's your first instruction okay, for this, if you want to tell This is things. just to get your attention. <laughs> um, okay, you know how a lot of working mothers, you're one. anyone here have children, know someone that needs help with babysitting? They have to pay out the wazoo to get their children daycare. Anybody know anyone like that? Show of hands. None of y'all have children or no children that need help? <laughs> wow. Sam, it's do you older, know any? You're it's young. It's an older crowd. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we open up our churches, not just uh -huh. this one, mm -hmm. but all the churches, we provide the daycare. Mm -hmm. To me, this is a great example of a monastery school. Uh -huh. Churches are small. We do it for free. Mm -hmm. We put our high school students to work. We put our college students to work. Yeah. We put our retirees. So this is moving into the area of something to talk with our, our task force about, the, the sixth grade in task force. Can we make it happen? So if you can, we can talk to them about it, and we can see what the steps would be to make it happen. But isn't that making a lot of red tape? This is a prayer time right now. And so if you have something prayer. specific that you want to ask a prayer for, then please, oh. please make that Employment. request. Okay. Here's Good. my job pitch. Okay. We'll, we'll do a job pitch later. Claire's the only one that likes me. I love you, but I'm also making sure that we're using our time the way that it's designed. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Gracious God, we give you thanks for the courage that you just placed in uh, Michelle's heart and the way in which she just gave such a great example to us of how you can overcome things that bind you um, with faith. And so, God, we do pray for her social anxiety and for the opportunities, the great ideas that she's just shared. We pray also for the sixth grade in task force and for the work they're doing to move us in a new direction similar to the way that she's talking about or however it is that you have in mind. So, Lord God, we ask that you continue to be and abide in our conversations and in our public witness and in our private witness. We pray also for all those who have spoken so far for uh, those uh, opportunities for care and for those places where there is such great need. We give thanks for the fact that you are active and present in all things and that your word awakens us to your presence and gives us courage that we might together find a new way. For we are again and again not reinventing the wheel, doing what we have been called to do, but yet finding a new way to be formed and reformed around your word. Lord God, we pray all of these things and all the other longings and blessings that are placed upon us in our hearts, we lift these to you, and we pray to you in the way that Jesus taught us about those essential things, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we turn to a time of offering where you might consider God's calling upon your heart and how you might, uh, as Michelle said, uh, not shrink back, but be, be large in the presence of God. Um, let God's word and spirit work and flow in and through you. It may be that you feel called to support the ministry of the church as it is with a financial gift. There is a plate, offering plate in the back of the sanctuary for when you leave today. There's also the opportunity to give online. There are a variety of ministries that we support from the Wesley to uh, the United Christian Outreach to uh, other things that go on in the community. And so we encourage you to consider how you might be a part of these, whether it's through a financial donation or whether it's through 
joining, uh, uh, giving some input to a committee, or just uh, putting your arm around a friend and expressing the love of God where you are. Take this time with you and God. It is your offering. Join me now in the prayer of commitment. Equipped with the truth of your love, O God, you send us into the world to radiate the joy of new life. Accept our efforts and make them productive in fulfilling your will. Enhance our gifts and make them... All we do, challenge us to be obedient to the call of Jesus Christ, to walk in faithfulness, and to respond to the tasks before us. Amen.
Friends, receive now the charge and benediction. The night is gone, the day is near. Let us lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day. Let us put on the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Creator who made the light, the Christ who is the light, the Spirit who ignites the light within, abide with you and all creation now and always. Amen.